Hello everyone, welcome to Restoring the Sciences. I hope we have audio here and you can uh, hear us. I know that uh, you can see us. But anyway, welcome to today's episode of Restoring the Sciences. Um, this is a webinar series that's sponsored by the National Association of Scholars. And I'm Scott Turner. I'm the Director of Science Programs at the NAS. And I'm your regular host for this webinar series. Our topic today is postmodernism. And this has become the reigning ideology of the modern university, it seems. This doctrine which asserts that truth is really an illusory concept and the truth is simply the outcome of an ongoing struggle between the powerful and weak. And this is anathema to the mindset of the sciences, I think, which asserts that there is, in fact, such a thing as truth, and that we can discern it through reason, observation, and objective analysis of the world around us all of which are rejected by the postmodernist modernist idea. So the penetration of the postmodern ideology into the sciences is especially troubling, not least because it undercuts the very philosophical foundations of science itself. Our guest today is Professor Randy Wayne, who is Associate Professor of Integrated Plant Science at Cornell University's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Randy's been an ardent voice defending the core values of science against the powerful opposition not only from many of his colleagues at Cornell and throughout academia, but his own university's administration as well. Uh, it's taken some guts, and for this, the Steve Institute of Colorado and recently awarded Randy its 2023 Courage and Education Award for his outspoken defense of free inquiry. Randy's also a repeat guest on Restoring Sciences. Uh, he appeared first with us on the 24th of March of this year. You can find that interview on the NAS website under the uh, media. And his topic then was truth in the postmodern university. There's been a lot of water under the bridge since then, including events at Cornell. So I thought it would be nice to bring Randy back for an update on what's happening. So Randy, uh, welcome back to Restoring the Sciences. So, um, when you visited us in March, you had this to say, uh, that Cornell University is now dominated by an administration-sanctioned postmodern philosophy that's based on the idea that there's no objective truth and that knowledge is a social construct created by those in power to victimize others. And so here's my first question. How fair is the quest for truth in the postmodern university? Things got better, or do you think they got worse? Oh, okay. So, we, Cornell has been on the news a little bit lately to show that we here are very interested in looking at the world through the oppressed and the oppressor. And after October 7th, we had um, a lot of um, commotion here where somebody had tweeted or, or sent on. Um, uh, through the internet, threats to rape all Jewish women and kill all Jewish men. Uh, and we had a professor that was that said that he was exhilarated and, and excited about what happened on October 7th. And the, the reason, I'll start with the professor, the reason probably he was excited about what happened on October 7th in Israel was that there was a change in the power structure, who was the oppressed and who was the oppressor for several hours, and that to him was exhilarating and exciting. Um, whether something was right or wrong, ontologically right or wrong, was irrelevant. It, it was uh, a change in the power structure. In the case of the student who did the tweets, or did the, um, made the online remarks, about killing and raping Jewish people. This, um, if you ask me, actually a victim of the postmodernist Cornell culture. Um, as Pogo said, we met the enemy and he is us. Here's somebody that probably, well, we know that he has some kind of mental problems from his mother. And um, so emotionally compromising a little weak. And, um, and he sees, well, what's really celebrated around here is choosing identities 
and uh, picking on the oppressed. I'm picking on the oppressor, and the Jews were the oppressor, so he just kind of, I guess, just went after them. And uh, So our, our campus, it, it, um, so um, our campus was in authority. The administration had no idea what to say or if to say, and um, because there's no reason, there's no rhyme or reason to postmodernism, given that there's no truth. And let's see. So I want to say that that was our recent evidence that we have. Um, a true postmodernist culture at Cornell that infl infiltrates everything from the students to the administration. Um, that's not good. So that's not a happy thing to me. What is happy is that there's people here, we have a heterodox academy campus community that's trying to fight the, um, the notion that there's no objective truth standing up for open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement in getting people to talk. The way we try to get people to talk is using the heterodox way by providing evidence, having intellectual, um, intellectual, um, oh my God. Integrity and I say um, being not intellectually um, nice. I mean, not trying to, okay. to look at the weakest link that the opponent has, right. but to try to argue, yeah. constructively argue at the highest level. Intellectually generous. Intellectually generous. Yeah. And to be intellectually humble to knowing that we have something to learn too, mm -hmm. and we may not be right. Being um, not trying to win an argument, but have everybody walk away better educated. And also, at the same time, be yourself. Don't be afraid to be yourself. And uh, so, in encouraging that, we actually have a group of people that meet once a month for breakfast. It's one of the uh, nicest hours of the month. We have um, some fabulous people. For example, we have. Um, Rick Dennis and Barry Strauss, who um, are now part of Jordan Alliance for uh, Responsible Citizenship. We have um, Daniel Sabi, who's a graduate student, whose um, brother and sister are filmmakers. They made the movie The Abortion Talks. This is one of the movies we're bringing in this semester on February 15th. Uh, the, we'll have a screening of the movie, and we'll have the two filmmakers come. What the movie's about is an incident that happened in Brooklyn, Massachusetts in the 90s, where an abortion provider was, was murdered. And in light of that, three pro-life and three pro-choice women got together to meet once a week for a month to try to understand the other. They never did. They, they never, I mean, they never um, changed each other's mind. But they came to understand each other, they learned how to talk, they, they learned how to make a common language where they can understand each other. And because when, you, when you're talking, you're not fighting, and you're beginning to understand. And if you want to search for truth, being able to speak is the best way to search for truth. So um, we, we have a wonderful group of people, and during our breakfasts, we make plans for events. So this year, the president has made it the theme year for free expression at Cornell. Um, although, as I wrote in the New York Post article, I didn't believe that she had any interest in free speech. That was just a cover for DEI, and truly that's all it is. And um, so we're bringing in some terrific free speech events. The first one was this fall, Jody Shaw from Smith College talked about her experiences after a fake racial incident with a so-called free speech president. Um, wanted everybody to learn um, critical race theory. Our second speaker was John Tomasi, who talked about the Calvin Report and was president of Heterodox Academy. President of Heterodox Academy. 
that um, he talked about the Calvin report and what universities should say, if they should say anything. Uh, on last week in January, first week in February, we're bringing in the Balikers, filmmakers that made a documentary film for the Coddling of the American Mind, the book written by Greg Lukiana, president of, of um, FIRE, and John Haidt, the founder of Heterodox Academy. On uh, February 12th, we're bringing in Matt Taibbi, uh, an investigative journalist who um, got a hold of Twitter files and exposed the censorship industrial complex that's censoring people. On um, March 5th, we're bringing, bringing in Greg Lukianoff and Ricky Schlott to talk about their book, The Canceling American Mind. And on April 23rd, we're bringing in the Steamboat Institute Campus Living Tour debate. And it's going to be a debate on free speech on campus in light of the Israel Hamas situation. And Ilya Shapiro will be one of the debaters. Uh, so we're doing our best to demonstrate constructive dialogue and free and fearless speech. And for me, it's really important because without constructive dialogue and free important speech, science can't progress. Then you're just transmitting received wisdom like the old days and not having a real modern university. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the, the real pernicious things to me about the, about, uh, the philosophy and the sciences is that by, by setting up this kind of uh, antagonistic relationship between uh, almost arbitrarily defined oppressors and oppressed, um, you bring the uh, you bring to the fore the idea that disagreement is hard, and that that seems to be need to be one of the justifications for really an anti-freedom agenda that's going on at the universities, um, and you know. The kinds of uh, events that you're talking about. I was at the Steamboat Springs debate last uh, last uh, I believe it was uh, spring about climate change, and the thing that intrigued me about that that I was really interested to see is how civil it was, and how how uh, even people who disagreed with the points of view of some of the speakers, how they how they actually disagreed in a very constructive way. But on the other hand, you described then that uh, there were very few, there was very little encouragement from the administration and uh, those kinds of entities to actually encourage attendance. And even though you had a pretty respectable crowd, given the topic, I would have expected a much bigger one. And so these flickering flames that you're talking about, you know, those things are wonderful and necessary, and it's something that we need to be doing. But in the face of this determined political push to uh, divide the world into oppressed and oppressors and to recast the language in terms of harm, what kind of head would Slow, but constant. Yes, I'm thankful that you are here so we can get our word out a little bit more. I can say that around me have become more and more courageous from not wanting to show up to showing up to showing up and speaking up and uh, it is slow I can say that it's slow although the people that are pushing the silencing of alternative views are unable to make any argument themselves how do I know this because I write to so um, I actually feel like an entomologist because I only hear crickets. And uh, I invite the, the departments that, that are involved, for example, to see, um, to participate in the event with Matt Taibbi. I've invited um, the First Amendment clinic people. I've invited um, constitutional law professors. I've invited the um, the 
information computer science people, I've invited the communication people, I've invited the government people. Um, no interest, no response. So they, they, they have nothing to offer. I, 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 I see no sense of strength, and so I'm not afraid of anything. I'll keep moving. Yeah, well, you, you, uh, you really have no choice but to keep moving, given the uh, kinds of ideas. So, the, the, um, you mentioned that this year is uh, the year of free speech. Uh, that's been uh, uh, So, what kinds of commitments has she made to the furtherance of free speech? What kinds of things is she doing that uh, is demonstrating that she uh, is at least part of agreement with your position? So, first of all, it's a theme year of free expression, not to be confused with free speech. We've learned that for this from this year. So, for example, the first event at the, um, somebody from the free, First Amendment Clinic talking about the First Amendment was not written by somebody that looks like him, which just makes it unimportant. The second event um, were four lawyers who essentially said that you can only have free speech if it does no harm. Okay, so that's really not free speech. They did mention that there's going to be some events where um, people are going to express themselves through fashion or through art. So I think the free expression applied more to clothes and art than it did to speech. And uh, another event had, um, was about freedom of press, and the speaker thought that government should step in and regulate the freedom of the press, again, to prevent harm. So this whole idea that disagreement causes harm is horrible for science. As a matter of fact, this is one I would like to read, the okay. words of J. Robert Oppenheim. Yes. Okay. There must be no barriers to freedom of inquiry. There is no place for dogma in science. The scientist is free and must be free to ask any question, to doubt any assertion, to seek for any evidence, to correct any errors. Our political life is also predicated on openness. We know that the only way to avoid error is to detect it, and the only way to detect it is to be free to inquire. And we know that as long as men are free to ask what they must, free to say what they think, free to think what they will, freedom can never be lost, and science can never regress. And yet you have uh, people like the the uh, law professors that you mentioned and the journalists that you mentioned who, um, who doesn't seem to be prepared to defend this core thing. I mean, I, 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 I've heard of this example, I've heard of other examples of journalists uh, saying that, oh, you know, we can't be objective anymore, we can't do this given the stakes. And these are the people who are rising to be leaders of their professions, you know, whereas I would have expected them to say, well, no, you have no business telling me what you're right, or you have no business telling me what to think, or, you know, outside of certain limits on free speech, like you can't incite violence, you can't threaten, you can't do all these other kinds of things. Uh, this, this is a very broad uh, area that, that lawyers should be defending. They should be prepared to get in there and say, no, this kind of suppression of speech is not what is intended by free speech and free thought. And so, where is that coming from? So it is the postmodernist university where all the rewards come from just going along with the postmodernist agenda. The victim, uh, oppressive mentality, and the fact that truth is just relative. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I, I'm hoping to bring in um, three parts to a series. Um, the first being The Closing of the American Mind, which was written by Alan Bloom, who was here at Cornell. And uh, it talked about the introduction to relativism so it began to destroy the university because, again, there was no truth, no meaning. The second part of the series would be um, 
That movie I mentioned, The Connolly and the American Mind, having the screening of that, which says if we treat people to not use the head, but to only use it emotionally, and to realize that um, what doesn't kill you will harm you, so to stay away from it, and somebody that disagrees with you is evil, mm -hmm. then they become emotionally weak and not resilient enough to survive a university life. And Greg Lukianoff and Ricky Stock comes to talk about the cancer of the American mind. If you can't talk about something and understand just what are the limits, what's reality, where are you right, where are you wrong, then you're living in this horrendous bubble, which I think describes Patrick Dye, why he did what he did. He's just an extreme case of everybody else in the now. The series of your the series of things that you're talking about, we're going from closing the American mind, it's still a relatively intact mind, to coddling of the American mind, basically uh, infantilizing uh, people's thought, to canceling the American mind. That's a progression that's been going on for decades now. And uh, I don't remember when Alan Jones published it. 1987. So we're talking about a course over nearly four decades here. And the direction has been one way. And is it? I mean, how do you reverse it? How do you bring it back when there seems to be some kind of big societal cultural force that's been driving us from closing to coddling to canceling? So the people in control of those forces aren't very bright. They're certainly not courageous. They can't defend themselves with words, even if they say this is the academic theme year of free expression, it's silent. They're weak. All we have to do is stand up, talk to your neighbor. In fact, I, I have a neighbor that at one time probably thought I was all right, QAnon and Jason getting root rubies, rubles from Russia uh, because I was against DEI because of its way of, of inhibiting free speech and that I was for free speech. But actually, Matt Taibbi's coming because of him. One of our other neighbors said, you know, you might want to listen to Matt or read Glenn Greenwald or, or Matt Taibbi, because they were far left like you, but they've was the center because they realized something was wrong with that way of thinking. And um, so my um, neighbor sent me um, an article from Racket News, Matt Taibbi's, mm -hmm. Substack, and he said, Matt Taibbi will come to any East Coast town, liberal town, for free to talk about, to have a town hall meeting where he talks about how the surveillance state after 9-11 turned into the censorship industrial complex that we have now and what he talked about yesterday in Congress. And um, so my neighbor said, do you think you can get him? And I said, well, I do know somebody that knows Matt Taibbi. So I sent Nadine Strassen, who was the former president of uh, CLU, an email. And an email came back, and automatically, if I am traveling for a month, I, I uh, get back to you as soon as I can. And I wrote to my neighbor, and I said, guess we have to wait a month. And then two seconds later, I got an email from Nadine Strassen that said, oh, sure, Randy, I'd love to. And then Amy and I, my wife Amy and I, went to uh, a dinner. And we came home, and Matt Taibbi had sent an email mm -hmm. that said, Hi, Randy, I'd love to come. When? Okay. Yeah. So um, it was very hopeful. And here's somebody that looked at me as an alt-right kind of guy. Um, so, you know, maybe I'm a little sensible. And maybe I have something to offer. Maybe this way of thinking has something to offer. So I'm very hopeful that if people become aware one by one by one, they'll come over to this way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there's there's no I believe actually I, I believe that human beings have a sense of truth. Mm -hmm. And if you can reach that sense of truth, they'll come to this way of thinking. And this way of thinking doesn't mean you have to believe what I believe. It only means be able to discuss different sides 
to come to a greater understanding. You know? the, um, the, the, the things that you're mentioning are all very, very helpful. And the, um, when we come back to this 40 year trajectory of the culture has been on it, and, and is it just failure to stand up that is allowed it to go, or do you think there are larger forces that are, that are society in this direction? So let me start with, I think each individual should take personal responsibility for the world around them. So, and all of us have a certain capacity to look at a certain number of things. Let so me say, okay, I'm a botanist, I'm not going to pay attention to termites. <laughs> Silly, I know. But or, or we make these these uh, divisions that are, that are artificial but help us um, get through the world the way um, we think we can be the most productive. And in terms of the sciences, I was completely unaware of what was going on with postmodernism. I read Jonathan Rausch's book, um, The Constitution of Knowledge, which is one of my favorite books. I recommend it to everybody to read. What is knowledge? What is true scientific knowledge? And uh, I liked it so much that I read his um, Kindly Inquisitors that was written, I think, in 1994. And I realized then that in the social... I had just actually come back from Japan. And when I came back to the United States, the one thing that I thought was different is I couldn't tell jokes anymore because everything was so politically correct. And to me, that was the extent of um, postmodernism. But I learned from reading um, Kind of the Inquisitors and also from reading um, God Saad's book, The Parasitic Mind, that the social science, these woke mind viruses, had been well established. And then after George Floyd is when those woke mind viruses became um, established here. In our department, I think I mentioned last time on uh, the Cal's website, it says about um, our school that when I was founded on, it perpetuates slavery. And uh, I think it's just, uh, you know, it's not true. And uh, as a matter of fact, Ezra Cornell was a friend of Abraham Lincoln's, went to, I'm not sure which one of his inaugurations, but um, one of his inaugurations, he bought a bust done by Vinnie Reed of Abraham Lincoln. It was the last sitting that Abraham Lincoln had done live before he was assassinated. It was really beautiful. Um, that's about when I got involved with the free speech movement when that bus disappeared and I asked somebody what happened. And I said, someone complained and it was done. So I asked around and I got involved with the Cornell Free Speech Alliance and people wrote in. Mm -hmm. College Fix had a story, Fox had a story, people from all around the world were writing into President Obama. Um, a new librarian came just then, Eileen Westbrooks. And first thing she did when she got to Cornell was to investigate the bust ending, uh, to her credit. And she saw that I was a true lover of the library. I think it's actually, if not the best, one of the best things about Cornell. And, um, and she decided to bring the bust back. I mean, there's a lot of pressure from all the alumni and people writing. And people writing beautiful letters of people that were Cornellians, or had, um, relatives that were librarians. They, they were just beautiful letters. And my wife thinks I should put them in a book and, and uh, save them. So, um, oh, where was I going? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. and so I got into, it, 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 uh, into free speech yeah. because of Abraham Lincoln, yeah. and, uh, and then the rest has kind of yeah. applied to, I realize this is hitting the sciences. Yeah. The 20, the, uh, after George Floyd, our, our, yeah, our department um, said, Cornell was founded on perpetuate slavery. Mm -hmm. I wrote to the DEI person and said, can you tell me if this is true or false, fact or fiction? Because I don't believe it. And I do want to know if it's true. Mm -hmm. 
And she said, let's just get past what's true and false fact of fiction and be more inclusive and equitable school. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was horrible mm -hmm. for a university to get past what's true and false fact of fiction. Especially when Hannah Arndt says, the best subject for a totalitarian world isn't the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist. It's for the person that doesn't know the difference mm -hmm. between true and false fact and fiction. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh, um, the, this this, this, this long-term progression uh, that, that we're talking about, um, uh, maybe there have been some interesting signs of progress, or for example, uh, in the state universities in Ohio, Etc. Uh, you have governments actually stepping in to say that uh, you no, know, this is a destructive ideology. You know, we can use taxpayer dollars to support that. Doing things like like telling universities that you cannot hire an army of you know, DEI bureaucrats anymore. And of course, this raises some uh, dangers and some difficult questions about autonomy of the universities and autonomy of the faculty. And uh, we left ourselves open, I think, to uh, the accusation that, uh, oh, you don't really believe in free speech, you only believe in your speech. And, and, um, and so one hopes that these kinds of grassroots um, uh, actions that uh, are in defense of free speech, that are reaching out to people, uh, it's, it's a kind of evangelizing that is absolutely necessary. But what about the involvement of political forces in actually correcting this? This is an interesting question. Um, actually, Donald Downs, who's a graduate of Cornell, I think he organized the writing of the Princeton Principles. And the Princeton Principles has, it, it, it contains essentially the Chicago Principles of Free Speech, the Calvin Principles of, um, of um, you know, for critics, but not a critic itself. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing talks about the responsibility of the faculty. The faculty should really be responsible for the university, for the curriculum, for who's hired, um, for what we teach, for how we advise, and how we mentor. And the faculty have ceded that role. Uh, much like the Congress has ceded that responsibility as, as well. And um, the Princeton principles say that the faculty should be in charge. But if they're not in charge, the, the, rep the elected representatives who represent the taxpayers who pay for the university have every right to step in. And I completely agree with that. But I think as faculty, we really should be speaking up now and taking the responsibility, taking our responsibility seriously. Yeah, which is why I, I, I come back, well, why we do a question of, of uh, using the, the, the first groundswell of, of, uh, of a day that's eventually you know, from faculty and from the people who actually are the reason for the university existing. Uh, you have the tidal wave or a tsunami that's going to sweep this away. I mean, that's... Uh, that's I can always hope that uh, what's what your take on the future in this? So let me say we have um, not just one wave, but um, our biggest wave here at Cornell is, is Bill Jacobson, who publishes Legal Insurrection. And he's been speaking up against DEI and its effect, negative effect in universities and critical thinking for a very long time. Um, we also have Richard Benzel who's um, been speaking up and fighting the faculty senate to have free speech at Cornell campuses in China. <laughs> a, a very contentious issue because people are unable to separate Chinese people from the Chinese Communist Party. So you can be against communism without being against Chinese people, mm -hmm. without being a thing to, to go against to speak freely against the Chinese Communist Party. We also have the Freedom of Free Societies program here at Cornell that's run by Barry Strauss. 
So there's there's actually um, quite a wonderful group of people that are contributing to hopefully to this um, tsunami that might happen. And because Cornell is an Ivy League college, it has a certain um, visibility that some other people don't have. Whether we deserve that visibility for other things or not is an open question. But I'm going to take advantage of that visibility in fighting for free speech and fighting against DEI. And there seems to be National Association of Scholars, you with the Restoring the Sciences, ACTA, um, FIRE, um, uh, the producer from Good Soup Productions, Heterodox Academy, um, they're all willing to put in um, resources to make the change, make that turnaround right here and this year. Because I think that the program that we've set up on free speech so outshines the official program on theme year and free expression that the difference will be obvious and people will know which one they can choose. There is a choice. So, you know, given that uh, you have these kinds of uh, uh, almost preference cascade driven movements and we have you know, different colors of ribbons, you have the Velvet Revolution, you have what's happening the other. Uh, what do you think the ribbon will be for, for this fight? You know, I hope the ribbon is around a little box that I give to my wife to say thank you for standing behind me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my wife Amy is um, the founder of Spouses for Rebels, Outcasts, and Troublemakers, and people with no sense of self-preservation. It's a support group. <laughs> support group as well. So the issue of the Cornell University campus in China, I mean, that's an, that's an interesting one because, uh, of course, the Chinese Communist Party presumes to have complete authority over the Chinese people, and we don't see any difference between them. So what kinds of experiences has Cornell had with the Chinese Communist Party? I mean, I'm sure that the interactions with the Chinese students there have been wonderful um, and uh, uplifting, but then you have the Communist Party that actually is in charge. So, so has Cornell been allowed to operate smoothly and freely there, or have they experienced some pushback from the party? Well, the university attorney um, wrote a letter that didn't want to push the whole free speech in the Chinese campuses. Cornell has decided to do business with regressive countries, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and China. And um, when Nixon opened China, the argument was, we're going to bring democracy into China. And there was no thinking at the time that authoritarianism was going to go the other way that those bridges work both ways. And I think we're smart enough to see that authoritarianism in those countries could affect us. Mm -hmm. So for example, is it possible that, that President Pollock was unable to come up with a coherent statement about Gaza because we get $1.8 billion from Qatar? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can tell us. <laughs> uh, so, so in terms of authoritarian countries, it's likely that they're having an effect on us. They give us an awful lot of money, mm -hmm. and we know money speaks. Yeah. So, um, in, in terms of the Chinese students, they've been wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let me just take this opportunity to say that. Uh, we can take questions. Um, I have a chat window here in my computer, but I actually have no idea what even the audience are seeing. So uh, please do start sending along any questions you might have for Randy Wayne, because we'll soon be going into a Q&A session. And if for some reason you can't, you're always welcome to uh, email your questions to me at turner.nas.org, and I'll do my best to, uh, 
to answer them and to and respond to them here. Okay, so, um, so the future is hopeful. We I always hope for the best, of course, and uh, uh, I think that we're aware of the forces that are working against us. Um, you mentioned Gaza a few minutes ago. Um, it seems that the uh, events since the uh, troubles there in early October, it's almost as if they brought us to a watershed. Um, you know, the, the uh, equivocal statements that you mentioned that some, uh, maybe your, your president has, has, uh, has, has, has issued. Uh, it stands really in marked contrast with um, with statements from people in similar positions in Israel. And I'm thinking in particular of the, uh, the, the, the statement of, of the Vice Chancellor of Bengura University who visited some of the destroyed kibbutz and uh, uh, had a statement. Um, yet the message seems to be a bit muddled on this end. And you mentioned uh, perhaps it's money from Qatar that might be influencing things. Uh, um, is it the money that's preventing our university leaders from being as normally clear as that vice chancellor from Henry? It's possible. I don't know for sure, yeah. but it's certainly possible. Yeah. So given that, um, is the solution maybe to to uh, scale back on the amount of money that's coming into uh, places like this to basically realize that this is uh, an influence that's going to counter to the values of the university. And, and, you know, should, we be, should we be rethinking how we fund our, our systems of higher education in these days in ways that can restore intellectual independence not only just to the scientists, but also to everyone here involved in the university? What's the role of money in all this? Should we think about cutting it back? Let's start out by saying, if we clearly define our core values mm -hmm. in a non-contradictory way, for example, I do not personally believe that DEI and free speech are compatible. And President Pollack does. So I think we have a... Um, a contradiction between can, can search for truth and social justice coexist as the telos of the university, as the fundamental uh, goal of the university? I don't think it can. And so if, which would be my preference, the search for truth became the fundamental um, telos of the university, then it's easy to say, what do you need? For the search for truth. What, um, what, kind of, what do we need? How much money do those things cost? And if we give more money, does it actually distract from the search for truth? So, for example, a lot of money goes into buying certain machines that are very, very expensive, and then we're sort of compelled to keep hiring people that will come use those machines instead of maybe um, searching for truth in more productive directions. So um, uh, probably money is very close to our highest core value, <laughs> um, if not our highest core value. And if we really um, honest about our core values and set those core values, we probably um, require less money mm -hmm. and um, less bureaucracy. And um, have a greater functioning university, a university where students learn better, where there's enough classes offered because the money isn't siphoned off into a DEI mm -hmm. bureaucracy, um, and where people are free to do any kind of research that they want without fearing that they may get the wrong results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, um, I, so. It's a very confusing answer to money does affect us. I think it probably is our high, highest telos, even above social justice. And uh, I would, I would, it wouldn't 
um, when I would like it if we were to choose the telos and the search for truth. I know my students just eat up the idea that they're learning truth and just not memorizing something to get a great a test point to get an A to graduate and then take a gap year. Yeah. But it would be a very hard sell to actually talk about taking one way out of universities, you know. And there's a um, there's a fundamental problem there, isn't there? Is if all federal money from, from for research and for teaching and student loans uh, disappeared from Cornell tomorrow, Cornell would still be fine. This would hardly you know, you know they're sitting on substantial endowments, uh, and uh, they'll be able to do that. The problem comes in that is that the strength of the American higher education system, if you can call it that, has always been this diversity. You know, you know if, you, if you drive around Pennsylvania or New England or, or almost anywhere, uh, the country is peppered with many hundred small colleges that are fairly limited in their mission, they can't be all things to everyone, but that very intellectual diversity, I think, has been one of the main strengths of American higher education. And the, um, the uh, institutions are going to be at highest risk if you start beginning higher education off of the tax, tax, uh, taxpayer uh, dole, it's, it's those institutions that are going to go under, not the corner. And so, do you think it's impossible to even be talking about, uh, you know, pulling the government away from higher education in the way, in the way that it's become so uh, uh, prevalent throughout? No, because the, if, we just, if we define what our true telos is, I mean, is our telos um, Country club amenities. <laughs> I mean, if if we uh, we only decide what the telos is, and we say, okay, you know, we're not going to spend so much money in other things. Maybe even um, it's it's not a bad idea to consider um, charging property taxes to universities because the towns around them. Um, I'm going to say they claim that they suffer, the university claims that it suffers by giving them too much money, yeah. but there's, um, there's, a, there's room in there to rethink the whole tax structure. Mm -hmm. And um, the university's bloated. Mostly it's bloated by the, if you ask me, it's bloated by the bureaucracy. So for example, somebody came to see me the other day because there's not enough faculty members that will advise in the program that I'm in. So um, I know that. And, and because of that, I have about 45 or so advisees, which is a lot of advisees. And she was talking about setting up a, um, an administrative position to do the advising. Most of the advising is get the highest GPA for the least amount of work, then graduate because we define success by you graduating and then take a gap year to find yourself. To me that's not good advice. It is the typical advice, but it's not good advice. And a faculty member can actually mentor a student. And um, but as we talked before about um, will the faculty stand up and take charge of their roles in the university? We have to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and when we don't do that, that helps the bureaucracy. Grow. And as the bureaucracy grows, it's even harder for us to take mm -hmm. control. Yeah. But of course, uh, you know, it's, it's not just refusing to take control. It's, it's, it's that we have a whole um, new landscape of incentives and disincentives for faculty members. And, and, uh, and you know, I, I, well, we, we've seen this in sciences where uh, incentives for promotion numbers and numerical measures of success in science or productivity in science, which is an alien concept to me. And, it's a, um, and uh, the 
landscape of incentives, uh, actually before World War II, was actually much different. You know, it, you you mentioned a quote from Robert Oppenheimer, and, and uh, of course he was involved in the big science of his day, but but he never lost sight of uh, the um, of the real value of science, and so that led him to to bring all kinds of interesting characters into the Manhattan Project who who may not have been all that great physicists, but still were great thinkers. And I think you do a lot of Richard Feynman, uh, Teller, uh, many, many others. And, and I don't think it's going to be allowed today in a lot of universities. It's always, well, can you bring in grants? Can you bring in this? Can you do, can you turn, turn this crank for us? It's going to help make us uh, bring in the revenue faster. Um, I don't know how to break that cycle and how to get us back to that, except in some fairly painful and probably um, politically very difficult ways. But, you know, you've looked into the history of science in, uh, in, in great depth and uh, insight. So um, what's your take on, on how the landscape of incentives has changed for uh, modern scholars coming into it versus and the kinds of incentives that, that even as late as the 1960s, people like you and I would have to speak when into the academic life. I don't know if there's ever been an incentive to be really innovative <laughs> in science. Um, it, it, people have um, paid the price all along, and um, I, I teach about how people discover things. One, one of my favorite stories is about Thomas Young, who was living in England. He was a physician. He discovered about astigmatism mm -hmm. and how to correct it. And um, then he said, yeah, maybe I'll learn about light. Mm -hmm. He said, if I want to learn about light, I should learn about sound. And he noticed the similarities between sound and light. Since he said, gee, light's a wave. Mm -hmm. Well, to say that light was a wave in England, Newton had said it was a corpuscle. It was like just such a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. And um, Lord Brougham wrote a um, horrible scathing review of his Baker lectures and, and Young decided, well, maybe sort of the academic world is no place for an original thinker <laughs> and uh, left and went his own way and did things like translate the Rosetta Stone and mm -hmm. other things to keep him busy. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he was an absolute genius. Yeah. And he was correct in his wave theory of light. And his way of measuring wavelengths was brilliant. He came up with the idea of interference. Mm -hmm. uh, he worked with Fresnel, who mathematized, mathematized mm -hmm. uh, his thinking. And, uh, but he was willing to pay the price. Mm -hmm. So, in the beginning, you have to be willing to pay the price. Yeah. Because... Uh, nobody, no, and, and I mean, in the whole world, nobody pays you to be at variance with current knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's, according to Albert St. George, that's the definition of discovery. Yeah, yeah. The, um, um, of course, in the 19th century, you know, you, you look at examples like the uh, Lunar Society in, in, uh, in the north of England and have of uh, incredibly diverse and interesting people from James Watt to Erasmus Darwin and, uh, and uh, some others. And this was a purely private group. It was a formal. And uh, something similar going on in the U.S. with the American Philosophical Society that Benjamin Franklin set up. And so real innovations, well, of course, science as we define it today we didn't exist back then. You know, the, uh, it's, uh, there, there, there wasn't a structure until Thomas Huxley came along for bringing scientists into, into the academy. Which raises the question, should scientists even be in universities anymore? You know, are, are, are universities a natural home for, for people? Oh, good question. <laughs> good question. Um, so, in theory, let me start with that. In theory, a university is a, a college, to use the root term, 
of the word collegial is a collegial place where colleagues can come together and discuss things that in general the public doesn't care that much about and be in a very nurturing and intellectually stimulating situation and have students where you can teach that way of thinking and pass on that way of thinking process, the method, and the results. Mm -hmm. Now, how close does that come to today's university? Um, there's, I can tell you from our Heterodox Academy campus community meetings that the only time that real, real free thinking comes about is that one hour a month. Mm -hmm. That um, mostly people, people are talking about the, the dean was willing to give us this much money, how can we make the best of it? <laughs> and uh, so you follow whatever the dean's idea or whatever the prophet's idea, and, and that probably describes mm -hmm. um, the faculty part of the university. And the students, I had a student um, that said to me he was hoping my class would be online instead of in person uh, because the only difference between an in online class and an in-person class is you had to show up in person, get dressed, but the teacher just read the PowerPoint mm -hmm. slides. Mm -hmm. So why not just do it in your pajamas and room? But we do all kinds of hands-on experiments and make observations and we just have discussions. They just didn't realize that and he was a senior, unfortunately, that a class could be that way. So the students have come to accept little. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so is, there, is it a good time to rethink what a university is? Should we have something um, a little more like Aristotle's peripatetic school? Mm -hmm. And um, I know there's actually wealthy people that would probably be jump at a chance to fund little bits like this as seedling projects mm -hmm. so uh, students can learn how to think critically. And people are interested in that because if you can think critically, if you can speak freely and make an argument, it's better for America. And I know there's a lot of people that want to see America thrive mm -hmm. and maybe would be willing to fund such. Um, such schools. Yeah, we hope so because they're 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 out there and uh, small usually. Uh, people who are there are actually free freer than they would be in the university. And uh, well, it's not you know high end, high energy astrophysics that's being done there, which requires a certain institutional framework to, to work. There's a lot of small things that are going on in the small um, independent research institutes. So, um, I was recently at, a, at a, a, an institute in Namibia that's focused on desert research. And there's not a lot of money for desert research, but they this was their focus. And, and when it comes to uh, natural history or wildlife conservation even, there are some very interesting examples of, of small institutes that are, you know, the, the one that comes to mind is on polar bear research. And, and there's not just one group of people who are working on polar bear research with a particular agenda. There are at least two or three institutes, small independent institutes that are working on polar bear research. And the interesting thing about that is that the choice of what's science to fund, it always requires money, what science to fund doesn't come from a, 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 a dominant uh, political agenda. It comes from the freedom of donors to make choices to what kinds of institutes they want to fund. And what you end up with is you end up with actually a greater diversity of opinion by having that model, a greater diversity of, of approaches to the problem you get with, with uh, this kind of um, uh, culture of science that's funded by something that has a political agenda behind it. You know, it's a sort of friend of mine calls uh, policy-based evidence-making. Oh, that's good. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and 
you know, maybe we could get away from policy based evidence making, which is another one of these subversions of the nature of science. And um, I'm sure, well, I hope that you're right that there are people out there who are prepared to fund it. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, I think it's time to maybe start thinking about that, that, uh, that possibility. You know, maybe it is time for scientists to say, that, well, maybe the universities aren't the best place for us to do science. Um, I can say from my own experience that uh, 20 years ago, yes, the universities were the natural place for people like us to go into, but it's become less and less uh, impossible to, to, uh, to, to do that as, uh, as the universities have been turned into uh, basically conduits for money. You know, you're rewarded by the increase in the amount of money that's coming through. I don't want to sound too Puritan here, you know, money is real or evil, but it does come with strings attached to it and agendas and so forth. And, and uh, I'm not sure scientists have been that aware that there's a price tag to the money, the generous money that they get from the federal government. So I know that you've been uh, fairly independent and of, of, uh, of these kinds of big government programs, uh, uh, and yet you've managed to make a good scientific career out of it. Uh, how did you uh, deal with the temptation of getting more grants, getting more grants? Well, I, I chose to work on something that was at variance with current knowledge, so nobody was going to fund it to begin with. Yeah. So, wow. so there was no temptation. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. I, I realized that right away. Yeah. And, and uh, of course I paid the price for it, because mm -hmm. the university um, yeah. gives raises and promotions based on Yes. But to me, um, I love science mm -hmm. and I love discovering. I couldn't let go for mm -hmm. money. I mean, it, I don't think there's enough money in the world mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that could have changed my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I once said to uh, uh, administrator above me, Cornell owns its space and its money, but I own my soul. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? And uh, that, that was that's why, that's how I can. Mm -hmm. Avoid that conflict. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned over lunch actually that uh, people who are very uh, successful in this model of, of science, where where you know, we have to be generating money, bringing in grants, all this sort of thing, they don't get to do science anymore. They sit there and they write grant proposals, and someone else does the science. They rarely get their hands to the laboratory. Yeah, that that's a shame because the the tacit knowledge and experience that somebody has when they're older mm -hmm. can't be transmitted. Mm -hmm. And an understanding of a younger person doing science and not getting the hope for results mm -hmm. and the angst that's involved between the, the grant writer who wants to see the results and the data producer who mm -hmm. doesn't quite have the experience in getting the results. Um, doesn't make for a happy situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when, when I was a graduate student, my major professor was doing experiments at the same time. And then when I went to Japan to postdoc, um, Ashi Tezawa was doing experiments at the same time. Mm -hmm. Not every day, because mm -hmm. they had other things to do, but they were still doing experiments. They were still scientists in the lab, mm -hmm. and they understood. Yeah. Not only did they understand science, but man, they they're great scientists. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, uh, we're approaching 4 o'clock here, actually past 4 o'clock. Um, I don't know if this, is a, if this is a problem with our live stream. I, uh, but, uh, uh, we'll see questions coming in for uh, Randy Wayne. So um, let me just take this opportunity to say that, uh, that the YouTube uh, video uh, when it's up, is a great place to put out comments and thoughts because uh, um, you can not only put them in there, but uh, we also go through and monitor those and we, and we uh, respond to them when we can. And of course, um, if you have any questions that uh, somehow didn't get to me or, or um, whatever, you know, do you feel free to send them to me at my email address. That's Turner at NES. OMG and you know I'll, I'll pass those on to Randy and we'll do what we can to to keep the conversation uh, going. And this was a fascinating conversation indeed. So 
I think that we will uh, bring to a close now. Um, uh, I'm going to give you the opportunity in a moment for your final thoughts on this, uh, Randy, but uh, let me just uh, close out by mentioning how grateful we are that uh, you attended today um, and for you know, your interest and support of this uh, webinar series. Uh, if you're already a member we, of the NAS, we thank you for your ongoing support. And if you enjoyed this uh, webinar, if you want to support more of it, uh, please consider uh, joining us as a member. We're a, we're a pretty uh, fun group. Uh, next, I'd like to put in a plug for our next uh, episode of Restoring Sciences. Um, our guest uh, that day, which will be in one week, uh, Friday, December 8th at 3 p.m., our guest will be Lawrence Krauss, who's been be familiar with you. He's an astrophysicist. Uh, uh, he's been, like our guest today, uh, an outspoken advocate for freedom of expression and the danger that's posed to science in our universities today by identity politics and the postmodern uh, agenda. And the title that he's given us for this is uh, appearance is going to be science uh, under an attack. Okay, and again, uh, I just want to extend my personal thanks to you, Randy, for being willing to uh, appear on our webinar. And at this point, let me turn it over to you for any final thoughts that you might have. I want to thank you, Scott, for inviting me at the National Association of Scholars. I'd like to thank my wife, Amy. Again, she has a support group for spouses of rebels, outcasts, and troublemakers, and people with no sense of self-preservation. So she's willing to take your calls and, and uh, the spouses out there. I want to thank the Steamboat Institute and, and Acton Fire and um, the, Cornell, the people in the Cornell Free Speech Alliance and the Alumni Free Speech Alliance and um, Max Aivi and um, Greg Lukianoff and Ricky Schlott and um, Jody Shaw and John Tomasi and the Heterodox Academy and all the people that um, are fighting for free speech and making the university, returning the university to a place for critical thinking, constructive dialogue, viewpoint diversity, open inquiry, all the things that, as we talked about Bill Help on, Humboldt, mm -hmm. that a university should be. And so, thank you. It's our pleasure, and uh, it's that kind of hopeful dedication to these fundamental principles that will uh, be, uh, you know, be the salvation of this. Uh, of this uh, and so, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you all in the audience for joining us. Uh, I'm Scott Turner. I'm the, uh, Director of Science Programs at the NES, always pleased to hear from you. And with that, uh, um, 